Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. When I was uh, as a kid, I had my own personality. I was very, very shy, a very, very introvert. My goal in life was never to stick out. So I had this goal in life that I should always merge into the crowd and I should never stick out. And then when I was about 14 years old, I grew about double the height of everyone my age. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, my plans are going out of the window, you know. I'm not supposed to stick out, but I, was, I became taller than everyone. I was like, oh. Anyway, I was thinking still, maybe I won't stick out in my life. And then when I was 17, I met the devotees of Krishna. And they started talking to me about practicing Krishna consciousness. And then immediately I became convinced. And then I was different to everyone around me. I was like, I'm not supposed to be sticking out in this life, but it's all going wrong. Then when I was 21, I thought still I can live a normal life and not stick out too much. But then somehow when I was 21, my heart called me to become a brahmachari. And when you become a brahmachari, you wear bright saffron. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Then I thought later on, at least I can merge into the saffron, <laughs> the saffron ocean, and not stick out too much. And then when I was 41, I got a stick. <laughs> I became a Swami. And now, here I am, sticking out. <laughs> Quite literally, sticking out. And what I realized in life is that sometimes we have a destiny. And no matter how much you try and fight it, you can't fight destiny. Everyone in this room is destined for something. So after some time nowadays, I stop trying to not stick out. I'm okay with sticking out. We each have a journey and we each have a purpose in this life. We each have something to contribute to the world. And each of us can find happiness and our spirituality in our own way. And the Bhagavad Gita is very beautiful because the Bhagavad Gita is the handbook of life. It teaches you how to find your calling, your purpose, how to understand your journey in life. So today we'll read something from the Bhagavad Gita. I'll share some thoughts with you. Maybe I'll ask you some questions. And, uh, and then I'll ask you if you have any questions, if there's anything you want to know. Of course, sometimes people don't want to read the Bhagavad Gita. They say, I'm not into religion. One person, he once came to me, he said, I'm not into organized religion. I said, don't worry, you love us. We're completely disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> we can hardly organize things properly. <laughs> but people don't like religion. They think like, oh, religion, it causes so many problems. Religion is just about money. Uh, the Hare Krishnas are just sending money to America. <laughs> I know what they're up to. <laughs> so people have all kinds of notions of religion, reservations. Therefore, nowadays in the world, you know what the, one of the most popular things is? S-B-N-R You know what that is, right? Oh, you didn't catch on in Delhi? Spiritual but not religious. Spiritual. But not religious. 
So some people say I'm spiritual but not religious. The interesting thing is that Srila Prabhupada, he never taught the Bhagavad Gita as a religion. He actually talked about it as a spiritual science. So sometimes I tell people, no, no, we're not practicing religion. This is a spiritual science. And then sometimes people say, no, no, how can you say this is science? Science is biology, physics, chemistry. This is not science. I said, spirituality is the ultimate science. I tell them, science teaches you about matter. Spirituality teaches you what matters. <laughs> science improves things. Spirituality improves people. Science tells you how to do things better. Spirituality teaches you how to do better things. Science teaches you to answer the question. Spirituality teaches you how to question the answer. They're like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> That's my set script. So actually the Bhagavad Gita is the ultimate spiritual science. And Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is actually making a revolutionary statement that I'm going to read to you today. And I am going to ask you to explain it to me. Because when you hear it for the first time, you're going to think, is this really Krishna speaking? But this is what Krishna tells Arjun right at the end of the Bhagavad Gita. You know when you're having a conversation with someone, the last thing you tell them is the thing you want them to remember. It's like, that's the lot. this is my last message. Right. <clears throat> of course, when I'm on the phone to my mother, she's like, okay, and the final thing. And then the conversation goes on for another 10 minutes. <laughs> because there's like 10, 10 million final things to say. So <laughs> it's funny, my conversation with my mother. But this is, uh, this is Krishna. Okay, so this is the final thing that he says to Arjun. Are you ready? Yes. Krishna says to Arjun, the final, most important thing. He wants Arjun to know. Sarva dharman panityaja Mame kam saranam braja Aham tvam sarva pape bhyo Moksha yishyami masucha Okay, clearly you've memorized this one. Very good. Let us just look at the first line of what Krishna says to Arjun. Sarva dharman parityaja. Understand, tyag, right? Tyag means give up. Isn't it? People look at us and it's all oh, tyagi. Something went wrong in life. <laughs> no, everything is okay. We decided. <laughs> they think always something has to go wrong before you take up this life. So tyag means when you give up everything. So Krishna says, "Pari tyag." Pari means like, isn't it? In English, we have the word perimeter, isn't it? You heard? Perimeter means all the way around, no? And from parimita we have words like parikrama. What does parikrama mean? Krama means steps. Parikrama means step around, walk around. Or pradakshina. Isn't it? Uh, or for example, who heard the Bhagavatam? Parikshit. Aksha means eyes. Parikshit means, literally it means to look around. But Parikshit means the examiner. Isn't it? I don't know in Hindi, but in Gujarati we say Pariksha. Is that a Hindi word also? Yes. It's Hindi word only. Okay. Sorry. Gujarati. So Parikshit means the examiner. So Pari, Parityag means completely give up. And what does Krishna want you to completely give up? 
Your money? No. Your family? No. Your job? Oh my God, maybe I made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Well, Krishna is not saying completely give up your money. Krishna is not saying completely give up your job. Krishna is not saying completely give up your BMW, Tesla and Maserati. Krishna is saying Sarva Dharma Paritya Ja Give up Dharma Give up Dharma? But didn't Krishna in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita say, Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya Glane Bhavati Bharata Abhyutanama Dharmasya Tadatmanam Sajanyaham Krishna says, when a Dharma is here in the world, then I come, Dharma Sansa Panarthaya Sambhavami I come to establish Dharma. This is very confusing. On one hand, Krishna is saying, I come to the world to follow Dharma. But then later on, Krishna is saying, Sarva Dharman Parityaj, give up Dharma. Some commentators are so baffled by this that they say, no, no, it's a mistake. What Krishna is saying is Sarva Adharma. That's more comfortable. Give up all irreligion. But no, it's not a printing mistake. Krishna says to Arjun, give up dharma, religion. Can someone explain to me why Krishna wants us to give up dharma? Isn't dharma a good thing? Isn't dharma what we're meant to be following? Isn't dharma what we grew up in our families learning is the most important thing to live our life by? So why is Krishna saying dharma parityaja? <laughs> Strange but true. Okay, yes sir. Uh, because we should give up dharma and pick up spirituality. But isn't dharma spiritual? Um, is dharma material? In the starting you said you sh we should leave religion mm -hmm. and we should sh like start spiritual. Okay, yeah, I said that but I want you to explain it now. So, this is very good. So, you're saying that we should give up dharma to take up spirituality. So, we shouldn't give up dharma to take up adharma. We should take up, give up Dharma to take up? Spirituality. Okay, that's good. Excellent. You get a price. <laughs> I'll figure it out later. <laughs> yes, sir, at the back. Uh, generally, you give up something for something better. So, in this case, the ultimate authority or the ultimate truth is Krishna. Mm -hmm. So, if, I don't know what the rest of it says, but... If he is saying that give up dharma, the only thing you can say is then accept me. Means so is dharma and accepting Krishna different? Shouldn't dharma take you to Krishna? Shouldn't dharma, isn't dharma coming from Krishna? Dharman, tushakshad, bhagavat, pranitam. Dharma comes from God. So why is Krishna telling us to give up dharma? You see, we must, uh, yeah, these are all good points, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but you know, I have to, I can't just give in. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's no fun. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Yeah, so maybe uh, because in Kali Yuga, for us, at the present moment, it's really hard to live up to all the Satchit Anand aspects of Dharma, and hence, uh, there's something easier he would recommend. You're saying we can't do all the rituals, all the yagyas, all the tapasya, we can't do all the different things, isn't it? Like... My mom used to say, before you go outside the door, you have to do these 10 things. Otherwise, something will happen terrible. So all these different rules, regulations, different things, mantra, tantra, visharada, so many things. So because we can't do that in this age, we should just give it up and don't do any of it. It's too hard. 
Okay, good. Now these are all good points. Why does Krishna tell us? What, what does Krishna mean when he's saying give up religion? This is like music to the ears of some people. They're like, wow. Krishna says, give up. I'm into this guy. He's, he's good. He's nice. Huh? What does Krishna mean? Give up religion. Yeah. Uh, I could be wrong, but like dharma is our duties, right? Uh -huh. So if uh, and every duty that we do, will may, maybe it have an action, uh, like a, a reaction, a positive or a negative. And for that, we'll have to come back again. Okay. So if we give up that and just uh, uh, make Krishna the center, uh, then you know, we go back to him. We go back. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you do your dharma is good, but you'll still get reactions, and those reactions mean you have to come back to the world and do it all over again. Wake up on a Monday morning and go to work. You have to do it all over again. So yeah, these are all good ideas. Well, after Krishna tells Arjun to give up dharma. And Arjun says, Sarvametad Ritam Manye, I accept everything you say, Krishna, as truth. Karishye Vachanam Tava, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. What does Arjun do once he finishes hearing the Bhagavad Gita? <laughs> the amazing thing is, he picks up his bow, he goes onto the chariot, and he tells Krishna, Now let me do my dharma as a kshatriya. It's like, did you hear anything I said? I said Sarva Dharman Parityaja, and now you pick up your bow and you fight in the war. So it's very, very deep. And this is the point I want to share with you today. What Krishna is telling Arjun is that you not that you should give up Dharma. But you should give up Dharma if it's not helping you to make a spiritual connection. Does that make sense? All your Dharma, all your religious duties, all of the rituals that you perform, all of the knowledge that you read, every Ekadashi that you do, every kind of spiritual uh, practice is meant at helping you to develop a spiritual connection with God. And if all of your religion is not helping you to make that connection, then Krishna says, it's not worth doing it. Because it's not helping you in the ultimate thing that we're meant to achieve in this life. Does that make sense? So Krishna opens up a huge possibility here that there could be many many people in this world practicing religion but not making any spiritual connection and to be honest if we look at most religion in the world it's like that people are going through the motions they're going through the rituals they're going through the different activities but they're actually missing the point of what it's actually meant for, which is to actually develop a relationship and a connection with the divine person. Once there was a man, he was driving, and he saw two people on the side of the road, and they were doing something completely strange. They both had spades, and one of them was digging the earth up and taking the earth out and making a hole. And right next to him was another man with a spade taking the same dirt and putting it back in. So one was out, in, out, in. So he was looking at this thinking, who are these people? What are they in the afternoon heat? They're working so hard. What is the meaning of this? So one hour later, he came back by the same route and they were doing the same thing. So he came up to them and he said, well, like, what are you all doing? They said, we're doing our job. He said, what kind of job is this? They said, we're planting trees. But the third person who works with us, who plants, to puts the seed in, he's off sick today. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but the show must go on. We've got to do our work. He said, my God. You are like putting the, taking the dirt out, putting it in, taking that. But the seed is not going in. What's the point? This, dear friends, is what we call ritualistic religion. Sometimes we do things, but we don't do it with the path with the intention, for the purpose that it's meant for. And therefore Krishna says, if we get into this kind of uh, religion, then we will miss the opportunity of what we're actually meant to get from the Bhagavad Gita. Remember, the Bhagavad Gita is a spiritual science. So how do you transfer going from materialistic religion to actual scientific spirituality. I'll just share five simple things with you. If you want to make the jump from going from material religion to scientific spirituality. And then I'll open it up and see if you have any questions. Point number one. Go from shopping lists to service requests. Okay. Most of materialistic religion is just asking God for material things. Oh God, can I have a house by the sea, a color TV, a 50 million gigabyte MP3? Jai Jagadish Hadev. Danam Dehi, Rupam Dehi, Dehi Dehi, give me, give me. Most of religion is just asking God for so many things. Can you solve this problem? Can you make this easier? Can you help me overcome that? Can you take this person out of my life? <laughs> so many uh, requests, isn't it? But when one is wise, one realizes when I ask God for material things, Ultimately, I come back to square one. Once there was a family, uh, husband, wife, and kid. So somehow they did some good work, so a genie came. And he said, I'll give you all one wish each. So the father got the first, first opportunity. The genie said, what do you want? He said, I just want to be out of the world and out of my family life. I just want to be alone. So immediately, boom, he just went to heaven. So he was in heaven, it was peaceful, no one was around. He was, he was thinking, wow, this is paradise. So then the genie came to the wife and said, what do you want? She said, I want to be with my husband. <laughs> so he was up there <laughs> and then boom, his wife came. Oh no. <laughs> so anyway, what to do? is here but at least we're in heaven <laughs> then the genie came to the child and said what do you want he said I just want my parents back <laughs> <laughs> they were sitting up there in heaven having a good time the door opened up trap door boom they came straight down they looked at each other they realized all of them used their wishes and they ended up back in square one When we ask God for material things, ultimately it doesn't satisfy our heart. But still we keep going to God, asking, thinking, if I solve this material problem, everything will be okay. One time Srila Prabhupada was driving and they got stuck in a traffic jam. And next to the road there was a sign, Roadworks. Temporary inconvenience, permanent solutions. <laughs> Robert looked at it, he started laughing. He said, the material world means temporary solutions, permanent inconvenience. It doesn't matter what you do to try and make a happy situation here. Sorry to be the messenger of bad news, but none of it is going to work. 
So the first thing is that if we want to go from materialistic religion to spiritual science, we have to stop drawing up shopping lists. And in the, instead, we need to come in front of God, come in front of others and make service requests. What can I do to serve? What can I do to help? What can I do to contribute? What can I do to help you make your life better? And as soon as you begin doing that, you will experience a completely different type of experience in your journey. The second thing, if you want to go from materialistic religion to spiritual science, is go from culture to being conscious. Go from cultural rituals to conscious acts. So many times we do things in our spiritual journey, but it's simply something we're doing out of culture or tradition, but we actually have no idea why we're doing it. At our temple in London for years, we have a bell. Um, and for years I would watch people and what they would do is when they would leave the temple room, they would ring the bell. And then other people would see them. And then when they left the room, they would also ring the bell. And soon, everyone was ringing the bell when they left the temple room. And I was thinking, why are they doing that? You don't ring the doorbell when you leave the house. You ring the doorbell when you want to come into the house. But what often happens <laughs> is that we just get into a pattern of behavior where we're not actually conscious of what we're doing, but we're just going through the motions of it. And uh, there's no awareness. There's no consciousness. There's no deliberation. It's just uh, ritualistic. And if we simply remain on the cultural level of doing things, then we will not go uh, very far. We should be conscious and understand why we're doing what we're doing. And then it becomes more dynamic spirituality. The third thing, if you want to go from materialistic religion to dynamic spirituality, is go from isolating to integrating. Most of the time we think our spirituality is something we do at a certain time in the week, in a certain place, uh, through certain types of activities. But Krishna, what does he say to Arjun? Yat karoshi yadashtashi yad johoshi dadashi yad yad tapasya shikonteya tat kurushva madarupanam Krishna is saying, don't isolate your spirituality to just a visit to a temple or a visit to a Sangha group. Learn to integrate spirituality into every aspect of your life. If you're cooking, do it in a spiritual way. If you're uh, working, do it in a spiritual way. If you're studying, do it with spiritual consciousness. If you're driving, especially in India, do it with spiritual consciousness. If you're a parent, don't just be a parent, be a spiritual parent. If you're a businessman, don't just be a businessman, be a spiritual businessman. In other words, learn how to connect every single one of your activities and integrate it with your spiritual journey. Then it becomes spirituality rather than just religion. The fourth thing, if you want to make the shift, is go from just learning stories to learning and understanding the substance. Every single story that you listen to in the Mahabharata or the Bhagavatam or the Ramayana or any story is not just a story. It has very, very deep significance because basically people keep going through the same things in their lives. And when you hear these stories, if you learn the lessons behind them, 
then you remember when you're going through that thing in your life how you should react how you should um, respond to the situation and so many many people know many many stories but they don't know the substance or the philosophy behind it and therefore it just remains again tradition culture and very very uh, uh, on, on, on a certain level of religion but it doesn't go higher than that and the final thing is if you want to go from just religion to dynamic spirituality then go from dharma to devotion dharma is meant to lead you to devotion what we seek in our heart of hearts is to have a relationship of love a relationship of love with God a relationship of love with other living beings we seek this bhakti this experience this exchange this reciprocation and if we follow all dharma and we follow it in the right way it should lead to an awakening of that love and that devotion which is within one's heart and therefore we should always remember it's not just about following the rules and regulations but it's about developing a relationship and reciprocation go from rules and regulations to relationship and reciprocation then it becomes spiritual so therefore Krishna is saying to Arjun abandon religion instead practice deep spirituality and the first thing is that you have to go beyond shopping lists and what do you have to do? Service, Service requests. Second thing is you need to go beyond just cultural rituals to being more Spiritual. conscious. Go from cultural ritual to conscious acts. The third thing if you want to make that shift is go from isolating your spirituality to integrating your spirituality the fourth thing is don't just learn stories but learn the substance. substance the philosophy the lessons the meaning behind it and the fifth thing is remember all of the Dharma is meant to lead you to devotion, devotion. rules and regulations are only good if they bring about relationships and reciprocation and therefore Krishna says to Arjun Sarva Dharman Parityacha Don't stop at culture Don't stop at stories Don't stop at a ritual Don't stop at just some isolation to a particular time in the Make the next step Ma Mekam Saranam Braja Connect with me And if you do that then you actually achieve the real purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna says Sarva Dharma and Parityaja, it is not a call for everyone to take sannyas. But if you're interested, we have vacancies. <laughs> but if not, no problem. Continue on, but make the shift. And let's be what Srila Prabhupada wanted us to be which is not just ritualistic followers of religion but dynamic practices of spirituality and then uh, our life will become beautiful in all ways all problems they may not disappear but they will not affect you in the same way and all your desires everything you ever wanted to achieve will be fulfilled beyond your wildest imagination but First, you have to make that spiritual connection. Hare Krishna. So thank you so much. These were some thoughts. Priya Saka Prabhu. You're not going to make everyone repeat that, right? You got my mood is So I'm just going to open it up for questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Really, really happy to have you. Uh, He's a nephew of Rukmanikish Project.
Oh, okay. From Punjabi Park? Yes. Oh, okay. Maharaj, I have two questions. I'll ask the most burning one, and then if there's an opportunity, I'll ask the other one. Uh, you know, it's been wired into us that, as you said, uh, don't take a shopping list, go with service requests. So then, naturally, over time, because we've heard it so much, we don't word or verbalize our desires mm. to the Lord. But that doesn't keep us away from getting attracted to something, you know. It doesn't keep us away from actually having desires. We may not ask for it, but we still have it. So how, how do we go beyond that obstacle? Just naturally having, you know, the, the inferior tastes that we've always had. So yes, we may not uh, ask God for all of those things, but still in our heart, we seek it, we want it, we wish we had it. And we believe that if we have those things in our life, then our life would be better. So how do we go beyond that? The only way we can give up lower desires is by experiencing a higher taste. Vairagya is a Sanskrit word which means renunciation. But the Sanskrit scholars, they say Vairagya has a double meaning. Vishesha Raga. Vairagya means detachment, but the double meaning is a special type of attachment. When you're especially attached to Krishna, then actually, naturally, those other things will disappear. In London, if you go around, everywhere they have graffiti. Understand? Graffiti. People spray on that. So if you try to rub out that graffiti, it's very difficult. But if you're smart, then what you'll do is you'll just paint over it. So too often in our life, we try to push out the negative. But instead, if we develop the positive, by doing more uh, spiritual activity, by following uh, our heart's desires, but in a spiritual way, by taking a risk for Krishna, by making a special endeavor, then gradually, why will Krishna not reciprocate with you? Krishna is a person. And uh, Krishna is right there to... Uh, He's waiting. He said that when you take one step to Krishna, Krishna takes ten towards you. So he's ready to reciprocate. But we have to uh, we have to allow Krishna in. Sometimes we're not seeing that Krishna is there in my life, and therefore the appreciation is not coming. So you have to let Krishna into your life. Just like one man, he was going for an interview. And he was getting late in London and he couldn't find a parking space. So he began praying to God, God, I need to find a parking space. I need to find a parking space. Otherwise I'm going to miss this interview. God, a parking space. And then as he turned the corner, there was a parking space. And he looked up and he said, don't worry, I found one. <laughs> We're not letting Krishna into our life. We're not seeing. No, no, Krishna is there. He did it for me. No, no, I did it. Karta hum. So, as we open our heart to Krishna, Krishna is real. Krishna is a person. Krishna is alive. He's active. He's attentive. And he's affectionate. But, we have to open our hearts. It's not so easy, but we can do it. And then wow. you begin to look at the things of this world, the arrangements of this world, and it doesn't look as exciting as it used to. Is that okay? Thank you. Yes. So you said in the beginning that uh, we can't fight our destiny. We can't fight destiny. Yeah. How do we know? You may ask, how do you know what is destiny? Is that what you're going to ask? I'm not asking about my destiny. Okay. <laughs> but, but I, was I can't tell you your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so. I do not know my destiny. I don't know what is going to happen after 
one second. So my question was that if I can't find the fight my destiny, mm-hmm. if me whatever bhakti I am doing is I am doing for next life only. If we can't change my destiny in this lifetime, so whatever good work I am doing or bad work I am doing, it means for the next life. Thank you. When we say you can't change your destiny, it means that there are certain things in life that are definitely going to happen. However, within that situation, you always have free will to act. In other words, say for example, one person is destined never to be rich. Some people are like that. No matter how hard they work, somehow or other, Paisa is not coming. <laughs> but they can decide how they want to use that situation, how they want to react to it, how they want to respond. And according to how they respond, either their bhakti will increase or their bhakti will disappear. Have you noticed how two people can go through a great calamity, the same calamity, And one can turn away from God and one can turn towards God. Once there were two children who had an alcoholic father. One of them became an alcoholic and the other one never touched a drop of alcohol. So they asked the first one, how did you become an alcoholic? He said, all my childhood I watched my alcoholic father. The other one who never took a drop, they asked him, how did you decide never to take a drop? He said, all my childhood I watched my alcoholic father. We don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And therefore, according to our vision, how we respond to things, that's more important. In psychology, they talk about the 90-10 rule. You know this? 10% of life is what happens to you. 90% is... So we think, no, no, Bob, Ooh, my grahas, my planets are very bad. I'm doomed in this life. We don't realize that's just 10%. Everyone's astrology is bad. Janma mrityu jara vyadi dukha doshanu darshanam. Forget it. Everyone's astrology is finished. Old age, disease, and death. I'm not an astrologer, but I can tell you, it's coming. (laughs) So what happens in between that? Yes, for some it's a little more difficult, for some it's a little more challenging, but to be honest, it's really about how we utilize our situation. But sometimes we look at our lives and we think, I've got the worst problems. Once a ruler, king, He said, I want to open up a gallery of problems. I want everyone to display their problems here. So everyone came and put their problems on display. So everyone else was looking around. Oh my God, look at this person's problems. Look at this person's problems. He said, look at this person's problems. I mean, it's not so bad, but this one. Anyway, they were looking at each other's problems. Sometimes we like to look at each other's problems. It makes us feel better. And they were all walking out. And then the king said, hey, 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 where are you all going? I've got a gallery full of problems. Everyone has to take one set of problems. <laughs> so now they went back in thinking, I have to take one set. Which one shall I take? So they started looking at everyone's problems like differently. And all of them, after looking at everyone's problems, they said, you know what? I'll take my problems and get out of here. <laughs> We think everyone else's life is easy. My one is the difficult one. When it all comes down to it, I'll take it. It's not so bad. So, yeah, destiny, astrology. That's why in Krishna consciousness, we don't put so much emphasis. Yeah, you can do your astrology. I had a chance. on on no less occasions than 15 times good astrologers said Prabhuji I can do your chart 
And you can do your chart. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But for me, I didn't, never did it. Whatever will be, will be. But Krishna is more powerful than any karma. Sarva dharman parityaja mame kam saranam raja aham dvan sarva pape So Krishna is a one-stop shop. Go to Krishna, everything gets solved. Is that okay? Anyone else? Comments? Questions? No one I can ask them. Okay, yes, yeah, sure. See, you said in the beginning that Lord Krishna says... Uh, can you just put the mic? Yeah. I think it's on, you just put it closer. Hello, is it okay? Yeah, switch off. Switch off. We can hear, we can hear. Okay. You said in the beginning that Lord Krishna says, uh, do not give up your money, do not give up your, don't leave your family. Except if it's to the Iskon temple. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, go on, go on. Sorry, I'm just joking. <laughs> and do not give your job. That is the one thing you said in the beginning. Then we were talking about the list. So first thing you said that, uh, go from shopping list to service list. Mm -hmm. And shopping list, we always talk about materialistic things. Mm -hmm. So there are two options in the life. One is a person who do not desire any materialistic things in the life and is doing only bhakti. Mm -hmm. We get that feeling that person who is not having any desire, he will always be very happy. Mm -hmm. We presume like that because mm -hmm. no materialistic desires, only bhakti is very happy. On the second thing, we presume person is asking for the materialistic things, but he should not ask. He should go for the devotional services only. He should go from materialist thing to the service list. My question is that in the real life, can a person be real happy when he is not having materialistic things in the life? If I ask Lord Krishna anything, I consider him as my father. And being a son, I have a right to ask him whatever I want. And he being your father, he should give to me. So there should be some <laughs> sort of a, so there should be some sort of a hybrid system. <laughs> so I keep on asking what I want and simultaneously. Prabhuji, you should write a shastra, you know. <laughs> To make a good philosophy out of this. <laughs> no, no, carry on. no, but you're saying that why can't we ask God for material things which are, you know, I mean, within reason. So, and simultaneously, people do spiritual activities also. So, there should be balanced. Be balanced. Ask Krishna for some material things. We all need good prasad. We need good house. So, we can ask for these things. Same time, do bhakti. What's the problem? Hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> so no problem we can ask. <laughs> yes, you can. And actually Krishna is happy. Even if you come to him for those things. But Krishna is happier when he can have a relationship with you where he's just serving you and you're just serving him without having to ask for anything. If you had a son and your son asked you, Dad, need a Maserati. I used that example twice. I don't want a Maserati, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful what you say on the mic sometimes. It's like someone might get me a Maserati or something. <laughs> Once I made a comment in a class, I said, you know, sometimes you just wake up in the morning and you want a Kit Kat. <laughs> in that next week, I got 50 Kit Kats. <laughs> that you're giving me. I said, no, no, it was just an example. I personally want a Kit Kat. It's just an example. <laughs> you have to be careful. Just, you know, it's going out live, social media is like dangerous stuff. Um, so if your son came to you and said, Dad, I want this car. Yeah, you'd give it to him if you had the capacity. He's your son, after all. But what about if your son came to you and said, Dad, I want to look at your future. I want to make sure that you, everything is cared for. 
What, where, what are you going to do in the future? Why don't you buy a house here? I want you to be comfortable. That would touch your heart. Because you'd say, look at him. He doesn't want anything from me. He just wants to serve me how he loves me. It would touch your heart. So if you want to touch Krishna's heart, then just serve him. And you know what Krishna will do? He'll give you more than you ever wanted anyway. A king once said to everyone in the kingdom, I'm opening up my treasury. Take anything you want. So everyone came and they grabbed whatever they could. And one person said, came to the king and said, I don't want anything. I just want you to come to my humble dwelling in the forest so I can serve you. So the king said, okay. But you know, when the king goes to a place, he has to be fit. So they made a road, <laughs> they came to the house, they built the house properly, they equipped it with everything, then only the king can come. And then everyone realized, he didn't ask for anything, he just wanted to serve. And he got more than any of us. And who is the example? So, we have to look for love, not transactional. Let's try to become transcendental. The choice is ours. But if it's transactional, you'll get some benefit. But if it's transcendental, you get unlimited benefit. So something is better than nothing, but more is better than something. Is that okay? Thank you. Maharaj, can you please explain the second point of going from cultural rituals to spiritual lab? And how can we stop our sadhana becoming sometime a cultural lab? So the second point I made about going from just doing it culturally to doing it consciously. When you add the spirit to a ritual, then it becomes spiritual. spiritual. So at the moment you take the spirit out, then it's just a ritual. So whatever you're doing, you should understand, why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? How and with what quality of consciousness am I doing this? Um, when you ask these three questions, why am I doing it, who am I doing it for, and how am I doing it so it will be pleasing, when you act on these, understanding the answers to these questions, then you're doing something consciously. But most people, the temple is a very interesting place. Because it's the only place in the world where people are coming and they all have a different motivation. <laughs> it's funny. When, when people come to a restaurant, they all have the same motivation. They want to eat. When people come to a hospital, they all have the same motivation. They want to get better. When people come to a library, they all come with the same motivation. We want to get a book. We want to learn something. When people come to a temple, they all have different motivations. Because they're not aware. Who am I doing this for? Why am I doing it? And how am I doing it? Therefore, when we know this, it becomes so much more meaningful. And uh, that, does that help? Do you want to say more? Uh, I was asking, like, how can we stop like some sometimes our sadhana? Oh, it becomes mechanical. Yes. Yeah. Cultural. Yeah. Therefore, we have to always uh, remember these three points and how to be more. So, like, say, for example, you're chanting. So, before you chant, take some moments. Whose name am I chanting? Why am I chanting? How does this person like their name to be chanted? Why do we recite the ten offenses every morning in our temples? Because we're reminding ourselves, how does the Lord like his name to be chanted? 
Why do we sing Mangalarti before we chant? Because we remember, oh, this is Krishna, we are seeing Krishna, this is who we are chanting for. So otherwise we are just, uh, it becomes very, very mechanical, robotic. Still has benefit, but not the ultimate benefit. So, Vijay, I wanted to pick up from your earlier point. Uh, as a devotee, you are expected to lead a simple and austere life, and yet all religions seem to be competing with each other to big, bigger and bigger and bigger temples, <laughs> and more grandiose temples, and you know more grandiose. You know, so uh, why why this competition? And I think this desire to build bigger, bigger temples and bigger statues. But do you think God really needs all this to, to be happy? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Moving swiftly on to the non-controversial questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, for ourselves, we can be, we should be very, very simple. Srila Prabhupada says, what does a devotee need? Roti Kapra <coughs> And not too extravagant. How much do we need? But for God, for Krishna, to glorify Him, He doesn't need anything. But we offer that to Him as a sign of love. But you may say, why does material things make God happy? But right now we're in the material world and we have material things. That's what we have to show our love. What is a big ornate temple for God? It's nothing like a piece of tin but it's all we have so we have to show our bhakti somehow so we build temples we try to make beautiful arrangements for Krishna's pleasure not for our comfort and we do that as a sign of love um, but that doesn't mean that we don't do other things also. We try to help people, we try to do charity work, we try to also spend money uh, making the world a better place. And we build beautiful temples. We do all of those things because all of those things are pleasing to God. Why does your son need to come and give you a present on your birthday? He doesn't. But when he does, you're happy because you see he bought that present it was for my money only <laughs> I gave him the money he went out bought the present and then he gave it back to me and I'm so happy because he didn't have anything all he had was some money that you gave him and he's offering that back to you with his bhav so when we go into the Ganga what do we do Take the water of the Ganga and then what do you do? And why do we do that? Mother Ganga, what do I have to offer you? All I can do is take your own water and give it back with a little bit of my bhakti. This is the great opportunity we have. So, But you're right, we should also do something practical for the world. If we just build temples and we don't educate, we don't uplift, we don't help people <coughs> who are struggling, um, then maybe we've become more just about buildings than the heart. But the other extreme is not to do those things because that's also a way of pleasing God. So I think we need a balanced approach. Does that sound all right? Thank you for your question. Can I go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Prabhuji, I grew up from childhood with ideas of acceptance, surrender. Don't wish that is what Krishna gave it to you. Like SBNR, you have social media now filled with uh, ideas of, you know, 
there is universe, there is Krishna, it's your God, there, there's abundance, all that abundance is yours. Ask for it, wish for it, manifest it. That, that whole school of thought made me feel, wow, I can desire and I can ask for it and it's okay to ask your father. And, you know, the whole idea of creating a vision board, asking, manifesting, praying for it. Manifestation. Yeah. So, uh, it, it felt like a release. Now I can have material desires and I can ask for it without guilt. But two minutes, uh, you know, with Prabhuji's question, you said a line, um, it rather not be transactional but transcendental. And I'm left rather confused. How do I now go from these transactions to transcendental? <laughs> like after taking that whole journey, um, I I really don't know what what next. <laughs> we all have to have desires in our life, isn't it? Like if you have no desire if you have no purpose, if you have nothing that you're working or trying to achieve for in your life, then why would you wake up in the morning? They say the best alarm clock in the world is purpose. Because when your eyes open in the morning, if you have a purpose, something great that you're trying to achieve, then naturally you're inspired to jump out of bed. Therefore, we all need purpose, we all need something that we're striving for, we all need desires that move our heart. Krishna Consciousness is the art of how to engineer your desires. Krishna Consciousness is the art of desire management. We're going to start a degree on this in the university. Desire management. Because the basic problem in the world is not that you shouldn't have desires but to know where to direct your desires towards in a way that will make you happy. The secret, Rhonda Byrne will tell you in her book, the secret of how to attract anything in the world. But you know what I want to do? I want to write another book called The Secret Behind the Secret. <laughs> Because even if Rhonda Byrne can attract anything she wants in life, she still may end up unhappy because people are trying to attract the wrong things. Even if manifestation was true, which actually is not completely true because there are other factors. But let's just say manifestation works. And whatever you want, you can visualize it and manifest it. We'd still be miserable because we'll be like that family who all had one wish and ended up back at square one. I don't know if you had that uh, game when you were young, but in London we used to play snakes yeah. and, ladders. and ladders. And you think, I'm rising, I'm rising, I'm rising. And then, boom. So by all means, have a vision, have a desire, be motivated. When I was 16, my uncle said, don't read the Bhagavad Gita, you're going to lose all your ambition. He was right. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I said, no, no. I have, I haven't given up ambition, but these ambitions that people have are too small. It's too insignificant. No. I'm striving for something more. That's the art of desire management. So be motivated, have a purpose, have a vision, but make sure it's headed in the right direction. Question your desires. Right. Okay. Yeah. The secret behind the secret. I can share my realization on this. Yes, please. Very, very can you wait for the mic so we can all hear you? It's just coming. Hare Krishna Prabhupada and Pranam. I'm full of gratitude for your valuable time. And 
yes, of course, the hooves. They have raised such a beautiful class for us. And we knew Clover. And uh, Prabhuji, this desire management is definitely a very, very important thing once we connect to the Krishna consciousness. I don't know about the others. I'm just talking about myself. Like I was a bit kind of TV addiction I had, few serials and this stuff. But now it is happening with me, like when you are all alone, then you are actually in your original. <laughs> Maybe in front of others we can pretend, but when we are alone, then we are actually genuinely in our original form. But it happens with me. Like when I'm alone, if I'm sitting with the children or the family, whatever they have their desires, husband wants to see, James Bond, children wants to see, some WW Marsh or something like that. I try to attend them, join them, but it really keeps me uh, away from that track. But whenever I'm alone, I feel like, no, I want to listen lecture. I try to switch to the news, I try to switch to the other subjects, but within 5 minutes, 10 minute remote automatically comes to the Krishna's lectures. I really cannot tolerate anything else other than the lectures. It happens, it's happening with me, it's happening regularly. As in when I try to listen some music, automatically it comes to the Krishna's kirtan. So, if, if the desires are connected with the Krishna genuinely, I am telling you that no other desires is going to attract or fill that place. So this is a desire management or whatever. So this is happening with me. If I was uh, attending this lecture, uh, Kirtan before the lecture, I was feeling like Krishna's dancing with me. Mm, nice. I'm holding his hand and we are dancing together. So this is something very beautiful. It is beyond the explanation. I don't have words to express that happiness. So whosoever is feeling that the Krishna consciousness can bring what? It is the eternal happiness, which we all are lacking. Because rest everything comes to me as a fate. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm, uh, I'm not able to e explain my feelings the way Maharaj is guiding us. Oh, it's he knows how to play with the words. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. This is a live case study. <laughs> the Hare Krishnas are getting into your head. <laughs> No, it's very nice. Yeah. No, it, it makes a difference to hear a yeah, real this life is a small, experience. Silly yeah. it's examples. It's, it's, it's really very silly thing. What I'm just trying to tell you that the kind of uh, addictions, kind of uh, daily on basis, on daily basis, like day to day basis, we can improve our desires or control the things. Maybe if we are more connected to the Krishna internally. Internally. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Roger. I see so many hands. Uh, I, I'm just, I, I'm conscious not to hold you too long. You know, it's a Thursday evening. It's, you know. I mean, I'm okay. It's up to you. I, I feel bad sometimes, you know, like when you put us in front of a mic, we can like go on and on and on. And Are you sure? Is everyone? Please, uh, are you sure? Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Okay. Three, three more okay. okay, sure. I mean, for me, it's not okay. Okay, yeah, sure. Thanks, Ramesh. Thank you so much. <coughs> the last uh, one and a half hours uh, have been... Is it okay? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not the problem. Thank you, um, the last one and a half hours have been revelational at so many points. Uh, there were two things that really piqued uh, my attention as, and I, I want you to double click, zoom in a little more. <coughs> there were two phrases. The first one was when you said, taking risks for Krishna. Mm. 
so that is one. There's one more. I want to land both for you, and then please, I want you to talk about. So you want me to say something about taking a risk for Krishna? Yeah. yeah. What does that mean? Um, and there's one more, uh, which you said where you said uh, we look at the world not as it uh, as it is, but as how we are. Uh, so, could you? So what do those about? two things yeah. mean? Okay, take a risk for Krishna. Put your hand up if you like taking risks. <laughs> Did you know? He was once. Okay. No, I was just wanted to know. Who was a risk taker? Did you know it's a risk not to take a risk? Yeah. Everything is a risk in life. But when I say take a risk, I mean be ready to make difficult decisions. Be ready to come out of your comfort zone. Be ready to go into the unknown. Be ready to give up habits and things that you've done your whole lifetime. They say the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. So to take a risk means, I want to humbly submit to all of you, that if you really want to pop, walk this path of spirituality, you will have to be brave. Because there will come points in your journey when you have to make decisions and choices which mean you have to be brave and bold and ready to go into the unknown. Christopher Columbus, he said, you can't discover what's on the horizon until you're ready to sail away from the shore. No, no, can I stay on the shore and still see? No, no, no. You have to take a risk. But remember, if you don't take the risk, anyway, it's a risk. So, Another English writer said, 20 years from now, you'll regret the things that you didn't do more than the things that you did do. Mm -hmm. So be brave, be bold. Don't be uh, afraid to challenge. Don't be afraid to experiment. Pray to Krishna. Take the guidance of the devotees. Don't do anything unnecessary or whimsical. But be brave. And be ready to explore the unknown. Because that's maybe where you will come face to face with Krishna. Is that okay? And we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. Because everyone is wearing glasses. And according to the lens on your glasses, <laughs> you are seeing something if you have red lenses you are seeing everything is red you know this so therefore Krishna says there are different modes of nature sattva, rajas, tamas there are different desires isn't it when you used to watch cartoons then some of those cartoon characters their eyes would just be like dollar bills isn't it? <laughs> You see dollars. Some people just see money. <laughs> you know that story? There was a... It's a long story. I won't tell it. No, won't tell it. <coughs> the wife was trying to convince the husband that he must become more spiritual. So the wife told the husband, you go with this sadhu. He's going on Yatra. So the sadhu took him around everywhere, everywhere, Ayodhya, everywhere. The sadhu came back after two months. He said to this woman, your husband is a lost case. I tried everything. I took him to all the holy places, met all the sadhus. He's not, his heart is not changing. She said, no, no, you have to try one last thing. He said, there's one last place I'll try to take him. I'll take him to Varanasi. So they arrived in Varanasi and there on the bank of the Ganga there was a funeral going on, isn't it? Open pyre funeral. So they arrived. 
the body was burning and the sadhu was looking the man was looking and the sadhu he looked at the man and a teardrop fell from his eye and he thought got it <laughs> so he looked at the man and he said what are you feeling in this moment seeing this sight of the body burning he said all my life i tried to make money all my life i invested in this steel business and now i realize if only I had invested in wood. <laughs> oh, no. oh my goodness me. <laughs> Difficult to change someone's vision. Isn't it? Not so easy. You can change so many things of someone, but to change the way they look at life, But the Gita is not giving you a whole set of ideas. It's giving you a new pair of eyes. This, dear devotees, is not an old set of ideas. This is a new pair of eyes. Want it? <laughs> okay. Should we take the last one? Hare Krishna. Okay. Yes. I, I just have a curiosity. Uh, if one is good to people, has good intentions, uh, bears no will to uh, ill will towards others, uh, serves people also occasionally, uh, but does not chant Krishna's name, does not do bhakti yoga, how will Krishna reciprocate in this situation? Thank you so much. If you try to help others, if you try to serve others and do the best for them that you can in a spirit of selflessness, even if you don't have tilak and you don't chant Hare Krishna, it doesn't matter, Krishna will still be pleased. Because it's a human spirit. Krishna doesn't look at technicalities because Krishna's name is Bhava Grahi Janardana. Krishna sees the Bhav. However, if you really want to help someone, then you have to have knowledge. When the passion to serve is accompanied by the compass of knowledge, then the compass plus the passion equals compassion. there's no compassion real compassion without a compass of knowledge <coughs> and so if we really want to help people then we really have to know what the problem is and how will we ever know what the problem is if we don't know who they are <coughs> If someone is struggling on the street, having a heart attack, and you're not a doctor, you may have all good intentions, but your intervention may cause more harm because your passion to serve them is not accompanied by the compass of knowledge. And therefore, sometimes people say, why don't you guys do something practical? Just giving out books all the time. <laughs> No, no, we do a lot of practical activities. We serve prashadam, we do welfare projects, but we also distribute tens and hundreds and thousands of books which have the spiritual knowledge, which give people the compass of wisdom, which if they combine with their passion to serve, can change the face of the world. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada said, we're not just doing welfare work. <coughs> we're doing the greatest spiritual welfare work by getting to the root cause of the problem. 
in IIT, the most prestigious of Indian educational institutions, they found out that students were getting so stressed out that they were hanging themselves from the fan. So you know what IIT's solution was? Take the fans out of the rooms. <laughs> On that count, we have to fail IIT. <laughs> fail. Because you didn't get to the root of the problem. You just addressed <coughs> the symptoms. And that's what people do. Is that okay? Okay, Mataji. Can I ask without you can't. a mic? Okay, sure. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. It's a little longish question. Take I the mic because then everyone can hear yeah. and it will be better, I think. Yeah, is that fine? Is that fine? Yeah, just keep it close, yeah. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay, it's good. Okay. It's a little longish. It's, I'm, I just want to collate some of the concepts that you brought in. It's on mute. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> Okay, there it's going, it's going, it's working, it's working. Working now? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a little longish. I'm just going to, coll I was just collating some of the points that you have referred to. And, um, you know, so at times you talked about being brave and hold it. Uh, you talked about being brave and being bold and also about choosing our responses to certain situations. Now, at times it happens, we are stuck in certain situations, maybe because we cannot change our destiny. And at that it could be any random problem with any random person. Mm -hmm. But you're stuck in situations because you can't change your destiny. You are uh, following a path and hence you're able to choose responses to adapt with the situation and not react, but respond. Maybe because you're on a path and you are reading and you're able to manage uh, 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 certain reactions yeah, yeah. in a better manner but at the same time mm -hmm. the problems show up in, in, in from different angles in different manners somewhere it's still pushing you away but you are doing it as a duty you're, you're in it you're doing it as a duty because you feel um, fine I'm not getting anything what I'm getting is it's my service because it's destined and let me do it as a service because I'm in this particular situation. It's come to me, hence I have to do it as a service and that's your way of, of coping and dealing. Processing it, yeah. Despite that, if it keeps pushing you, but it's your duty, but it's your service, how do you be brave and bold? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I did. But I could yeah, yeah, frame my question. No, no. I, okay. I think I got it. Yeah. In essence, what I understand you're saying is that certain things happen in life and you've trained yourself to try to be flexible, to respond to it. But then sometimes certain things happen in life which you're responding to but which seem to be taking away from your spiritual life. So... The question is, should we just keep on tolerating it or should we change? Is that your question? Uh, just the tail end is a little different. Okay. That um, despite all your or different responses and no reactions, uh, there, is, there is still pushing away that, okay, now, you know, you can't handle this issue. You can't do it. So go away, go away. But you can't <coughs> go away from it because it's your duty. It's your service. Okay. Then okay. what do I do? That's what I... How do I be brave and bold then? Krishna will never send you an obstacle or a challenge that you can't overcome. Krishna has two qualities. He's the Ishvara, which means the controller of everything. And the second thing is he's the Surid. He's the friend of everyone. Now, if you've got a friend that's in control of everything, that's pretty good news. <laughs> because it means that whatever's coming to you, by divine arrangement, if it's inescapable and it seems to be destiny, somehow or other has to be tailored in such a way 
that pregnant within it is an opportunity to evolve your spirituality but the problem is that right now we're not seeing the opportunity of the situation but rather what we're focused on is the difficulty of the situation so they say an optimist is someone who sees opportunities in every problem whereas a pessimist is someone who sees problems in every opportunity so to shift to that i you know that that paradigm of spiritual optimism takes deep spiritual advancement but that's what the greatest devotees are able to do they're able to see that within the greatest calamity the greatest challenge the greatest struggle is also the greatest opportunity to come closest to Krishna. John the Baptist in the Christian tradition says, God puts great people through great trials so that they can do great things in their life. So Krishna says in the Bhagavatam, Yasyaha Manugranami Harishye Taddhanam Shane Tadodhanam Tyajantasya Svajana Dukadukitam Krishna says, when I especially favor someone, then I take away everything. Put your hands up if you want the mercy. <laughs> okay. That sounds dangerous. Yes, Krishna may. And it's shocking. And maybe many of us can't digest it. Therefore, Krishna doesn't do it to us. But when Krishna does start taking things away, we have to see, this is Krishna giving me an opportunity to rely more on him. But to make that shift, we need the association of devotees. Because when we can't see our situation, they can help us. And therefore, the Vaishnavas are very, very important in our life. They are the stick of mercy that keep you walking on the path even when you feel like you're falling down. So have many friends in Krishna consciousness. And with friends, you can go through anything. No problem. Okay? All right, thank you so much for your time, your attention, your uh, energy. Really appreciate it. Shrimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Shri Prabhupada ki, Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.